background would be great. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Uh... Yeah, probably. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Great, thanks. Thanks for coming on with us. Yeah. Uh, Mark Mark can't make it tonight, so <clears throat> just you and I. But yeah, you got lots of horses to talk about, so <clears throat> yeah, it should be fun. Now, is this the most you've had coming into a season, like in terms of two and three-year-olds? Wow. Was that by design or did, did it just kind of sneak up on you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, a lot of people have kind of an ideal number, whether it's a trainer or owner, that they, they find comfortable. So that's it for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, she, boy, she quietly had a, a big year last year, and I mean... With Party Girl Hill in the mix, uh, you know, she might have had a couple of more wins if it wasn't for her. So where, uh, where are you joining us from tonight? Are you in Kitchener? I'm a -okay. okay. Sitting in the shade. <laughs> Turns out the grass was green and so was the pain. Yeah, I'm a -okay. Sitting in the shade. Turns out the grass was green and so was the pain. Cause I've been doing just
to seven outstanding pacers, including Better Than Cheddar, a proven sire of Ontario Sire Stinks gold winners. Three rich performers stand their second season in 2021, including O'Brien Award winner Jimmy Freight, Horse of the Year McWicked, and O'Brien Award winner Stag Party. Also standing, Millionaire's Art Spink, Better's Delight, and Shadow Play. For more information, it's winbackfarm.com. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to a live edition of COSA TV on this Sunday night. I'm Greg Blanchard, and uh, joined tonight by a special guest, Steve Heimbecker, and uh, I'm sure most people uh, that follow racing have heard the name. Uh, he's involved in the ownership of uh, many high-profile horses around North America. So, uh, Steve, welcome to the show, and maybe tell us where you're uh, joining us from tonight. Uh, this is the confines of my office in Waterloo. Um, three young kids and a loud, noisy dog will force me here <laughs> on occasion. So tonight's where I am. This is where I am. Good, and, uh, and I understand it's pretty close to home for you as well. Yeah, it's about a 10-minute jaunt. It's it's not a, a big trip, so um, I've been known to come in and work uh, in the evening sometimes. So um, second home, not far, uh, easy logistics. Well, as I mentioned, uh, you know, your name is prominent with, uh, with many high-profile horses, and, and we're going to talk about uh, a number of them uh, tonight, but... Tell us, first of all, just about your background. Um, you know, what do you do uh, for a living away from the horse game? Yeah, so I've been involved uh, in the finance business for a number of years, um, uh, about 19 to be exact. So when I started my career, um, I was at the bank, like most people uh, start with. So I was at the bank for a short period of time because uh, it didn't really work for me, and I knew that I wanted to be a little bit more creative and, uh, you know, sell different flavors of ice creams. At that point, I was uh, in the mortgage business. So uh, being with uh, a singular balance sheet lender didn't really afford me a lot of um, uh, opportunities or uh, different uh, products to sell. So I got into the brokering space and uh, became a mortgage broker. And that's really been the, the, the background of what I've done for the past almost 20 years. Um, and we've, we've plugged in different things into our business now. So I'm running a company now that I'm, I'm, I founded and I'm president of, it's called nest egg. Uh, and nest egg is a company that basically is providing alternative solutions, borrowing solutions for clients that might be challenged and may not fit in the, the traditional box that the, the, the banks provide these days. Um, and, and with obviously what's going on right now, they become a lot more stringent and it's tougher to get deals approved. So um it's a it's an exciting space for me i enjoy dealing with the clients i enjoy the problem solving component of it um we do run a large um office it's uh, big numbers we do uh most of our business in the confines of ontario geographically speaking um 
and we're here to help. It's uh, it's kind of a feel good thing. Yeah, you, you're able to make uh, you know some 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 good money and uh, help people, and um, you know that's what we're here for. So um, yeah, it's 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 been a it's been a great uh, a great go so far. It's been two years in the in the making, and and again we've plugged in insurance and um, investment products and and uh, mortgage administration and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's what allows me to have my fun and my, my true passion, which is, uh, uh, the horse racing uh, business. And I like, uh, I assume a play on words, nest egg, uh, in terms of that, did you come up with that one yourself? I didn't actually, I paid someone to come up with that. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically enough, but yeah, nest egg, it is a play on words. It's, um, you know, it really is about that, that nest egg sort of approach and, and, you know, it's about having uh, your money working um, smarter, not harder. And I think that's, especially in today's day and age with, with uh, the implications of COVID, for example, people are having to adapt and, and they're working smarter, whether it be from home, um, you know, cutting out the distance or the exposure to other people and what have you. But that's that's just kind of our, our motto and our theme. But yeah, it's uh, that's what it's all about, that nest egg. And I was going to ask, uh, how how has your business uh, been affected by by the COVID pandemic? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm often asked that, and and with the rates being so low right now, you'd think that we'd be um, busy in the first mortgage business, but we're not. The private the private stuff is just absolutely taken off. Um, and I think the challenge is, is, I think a lot of the people out there. Um, have been affected. So whether their their pay or, or their their salaries have been decreased, maybe their hours are less, uh, maybe productivity from home isn't the same as what it used to be. And companies are having to make some sort of, you know, provisions or cuts to maybe stay afloat. Um, so from that perspective, it's really increased our private business. Um, but I would look at those as more of uh, Band-Aid deals. Like they're, they're more temporary for our clients. Uh, they're not a permanent fix, but um, to your point, uh, yeah, it's it's been busy, so it's affected it in a positive way. Um, but we know people are struggling, so we're just we're doing what we can. So, all right, joined by uh, Steve Heimbecker tonight uh, from uh, his office in Waterloo, uh, talking a little bit about what he does, and of course uh, his involve- involvement in standard bread racing, and uh, particularly in the province of Ontario. I want to welcome all of our viewers tuning in once again tonight. Uh, As always, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Drop us a comment. uh, If uh, you're watching tonight online, let us know where you're tuning in from. And if uh, you got a question to pass along to myself or Steve, uh, we'll try and work that in uh, at some point during the show as well. So uh, we know a little bit more about your business background, Steve, and and, uh, what's, I, I suppose, given you the ability to to dive into horse ownership uh, the way you have, but uh, go back and tell us how, how you first became exposed to harness racing. Yeah, so typical Ontario story. Um, growing up in Waterloo, we used to have a track not too far down Highway 86, uh, Elmira Raceway, and uh, Elmira was uh, uh, was my stomping grounds, and I, I do recall um, going there with my dad. So my dad. Uh, um, and his dad, who I never met, was uh, was was into um, the thoroughbreds. So my dad, Fred, uh, uh, Fred gave me an early uh, exposure to the harness racing uh, uh, industry. I, I do recall when two dollar bills were still around. <laughs> if people can, we're dating, we're dating. I'm dating too. myself here, but yeah, <laughs> the two dollar bills. Um, you know, I remember just kind of you know peeking up and, and placing a bet at uh, Greenwood or. You know uh wherever it was at that point but our stomping ground was uh elmira i used to go there with my dad on on pretty much every occasion that we could typically more in the summer times when the weather was nice um on the way up to the cottage we'd stop at barry for example and uh we'd always go to mohawk if uh, we had an opportunity um so that's that's where it came from so I, it's almost in the blood um and from there i just you know what it's it's a love for the animal first and then a love for the sport second. I mean, I, I just, uh, horse, horses are great. Um, uh, being around them is fantastic. Uh, and I've just acquired a real, uh, real interest in the, um, in the standard breads. 
Yeah, I think uh, Elmira really is the, or was the prototypical grassroots racetrack. Um, yeah, I remember uh, some trips there as well, and, and uh, it definitely had that vibe to it. Uh, you probably yep. remember the old uh, cardboard, I guess it was cardboard, the old tote tickets that you used to get as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Remember those days? Absolutely. So, yeah, those the good old days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, you know, to think uh, about your exposure there uh, uh, at small town Ontario and Elmira uh, to where you are today and uh, owning upwards of, of 60 horses um, across North America and, and racing in many of the biggest races. Uh, did you have that as a, as a vision early on or did you have kind of that uh, a game plan when you when you started in horse ownership? Uh not really. I'm more of a day-to-day -day type uh, uh, approach to things. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate with uh, the success in my business and, and, and working hard. And it's allowed me some of the things um, like getting involved in the, uh, in, the, in the harness business, probably to a greater extent. Uh, we spoke before the show. I think I'm probably at my max right now. This is my max comfort level at 60-some-odd horses, I think. Uh, um, you know, this is this is probably I don't know if this is a sweet spot or not, but um, I didn't really envision having that many. It just kind of happened. And most of them are with really good partners as well. I should say that it's it's not me exclusively on these horses. Uh, it's one of the things I enjoy about this business so much is the uh, is the relationships I have with people, whether it's it's the people I own horses with, the owners, um, you know, the trainers and, and, you know, what have you. So. Yeah, you're maybe a little bit different than, than some in the fact, uh, Steve, that you uh, you own some horses outright yourself. Uh, you have many in partnership. And um, because of that, you've got uh, horses in almost every range and you've got them with several different uh, trainers, correct? So, so it, it would seem to me that, yeah, the relationship uh, part of it is, is a big motivator for you. Yeah, it is. And you know what? I... <laughs> I really, and I gravitate towards people that are not younger by design, but just that maybe need some opportunity. Because I really believe, especially in this business, um, it's really tough to to cut your teeth. You know, uh, it's it's tough to be presented with those opportunities, whether you're driving, whether you're training, or you know, whether you're involved in park ownership or what have you. Uh, so for me, by design, I've I've really selected some some different types of trainers for different reasons. Um, and I'm hoping we get some opportunity. It's not a, it's not a handout. Uh, we need some, we need some results and, and some performance. I mean, you know, there is a measurement on my end, but certainly I'm not opposed to giving people opportunity. Um, and let's face it, the young people in the business today are going to be the stars of tomorrow. So they've got to start somewhere. And if I intend to be around for another 20 or 30 years, um, I want to have an affiliation with those people. So for me, it's, it's, it's by design. I, I spread it around um, purposely and uh, hopefully it pays off. So really, uh, you, you know, you're investing from your own perspective, but you're also investing um, in some of the young talent in Ontario and I'm sure uh, they appreciate it. And uh, I think it all kind of helps uh, the wheels in motion here and uh you know there's a reason we have a great product here in ontario and it's because uh we've got a lot of uh got a lot of good owners like yourself uh, brad grant's one that you're partnering with john fielding uh you know they put a lot of money into the game uh, they they're very successful of course but uh it keeps the engine turning no question about that um we've got a question uh, let's let's get to that and then we'll start talking a little bit about some of your horses uh, here in a few moments sure. tyler baker uh, thanks for writing in, Tyler. Do you have any horses going to Batavia Downs this year? And I don't know if he's talking about overnight horses. Did you raise some there? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I recently uh, I recently got a few small claimers, and they may end up down in Batavia. But uh, on, on the stakes circuit, uh, I can't say for sure. I, I, I don't believe it'll be a, a mainstay stop, uh, Tyler, but... You never know. Um, I'm not overly familiar with that track, um, to be quite honest. So, um, in the in the decision on a lot of this stuff, or at least direction on where the the yearlings will race or the the um, the older horses will race, will be done by the trainer. So, 
Um, I may not even know until uh, a week before myself, but <laughs> I appreciate the question. And you've had uh, certainly some New York Sire Stakes performers, but uh, in, in recent years, uh, you've really started to, to really focus your attention back here in Ontario. Um, and I think I read a recent article uh, about that. Talk a bit about about uh, why you've really taken that approach, um, especially in the last couple of years. Yeah, you know, um, for me, the Ontario program is something that, um, and you mentioned Brad and, and John um, earlier, you know, you've got some huge advocates for Ontario racing and you've got some some really strong supporters um, right right in, in, the, in Ontario. And I think for me, I want the product to get better. You know, we've seen some of the, the uh, betters delights, uh, both on the, on the pacing side um, and the, the, the Philly side, do some amazing, amazing things on the Grand Circuit. And I think, you know, we have to improve um, what we're getting out of Ontario. I think we've got obviously one of the best grassroots programs, a great gold program, like we are, we are just put together very well, and I think continued support of what we're doing in Ontario is an integral part of ensuring that we're here for the long ride. And longevity in this business is something that, especially in our own backyard, that we've got to preserve. You know, and I don't mind racing in New York. And uh, you know, there's some big races at some of those tracks and on the Grand Circuit that I'd love to be a part of, and uh, hopefully, you're racing there. It's not like I'm opposed to racing at the um, at the U.S. Uh, marquee tracks, but certainly I believe personally that, uh, you know, we've got the best racetrack in our own backyard. So why not support it? True. Uh, uh, well said. Uh, let's let's talk some sons of better's delight uh, or offspring of better's delight. Uh, since you mentioned him, we might as well start there. Um, and now I did some math before we we came on and uh We've got some two-year-olds, uh, Mohawk Million eligibles, and other two-year-old pacers to talk about. Uh, I did some quick math, and it was about a million five in investment altogether. So um, you're definitely, uh, you know, taking a shot, and uh, you've got some regally bred youngsters, and a couple of them are by Better's Delight. Shanghai Sealster, 150K at, at the London sale, and Addison Sealster as well, $100,000 yearling. Um, let's talk about Shanghai, first of all, um, a, a lucrative purchase, a soiree, seals near the dam, a $240,000 winner, I believe, and only 10 career starts, and uh, this is her first full. So uh, exciting, I'm sure, uh, to see this one finally hit the racetrack. What are the early reports on both Shanghai and Addison seals <clears throat> Well, I, you hit two good ones right away. Um, I... Uh... Greg McNair is uh, training uh, Shanghai in Florida. And uh, as we know, Greg's a, a man of few words, but uh, when he speaks, you listen. Uh, and I really like Greg. I've known Greg for probably 20 years now. Um, and uh, he loves the Philly. She's going fantastic. She's, he's pr she's probably uh, one of his favorites down there, um, which again, uh, you know, man of few words, that's a good thing. Um, she's coming along really nice. I believe that he actually had the, the dam. I, I, I might be, I, I, I think, I think Tony, there was an affiliation. Tony O'Sullivan. Was it Tony? Tony? Okay. Had it, and then I think, uh, I think Tony, but okay. again, we've got viewers out there that are on top of this. So, uh, if, yeah. if I'm wrong or Steve's wrong, by all means, uh, yeah, send us but he's excited, it. you know, she, she, she's doing everything right. Um, she's very good size. The betters traditionally are a little smaller and then they kind of grow into themselves, but obviously they've got big motors. Uh, he's extremely excited uh, about her. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I basically just put it to Greg. He called me one night or I called him and I said, listen, and I might talk to Greg once every six weeks and that's fine with me. I'm good. And I said, Greg, which one's your favorite? And I think I have about four or five of them. I said, I just want to know which one's your favorite. You don't have to tell me how good, how far along. I don't need times. Which one's which one do you think is is the best right now? And he said, Shanghai. I said, that's all I needed to know. I just hung up the phone. So <laughs> anyway, good reports on her. And then as far as um, Addison goes, that was another Philly buy out of the London sale. Um, she's with Amanda Fine out of Classy Lane. And um, 
Amanda loves the Philly. It's uh, the favorite in her barn as well. Um, she uh, She's doing everything right. She's good size. I saw her about two weeks ago. The Philly looks fantastic. Um, she's got a little fire in her, but you want your Phillies to have a little fire. So um, I wouldn't say she's got an attitude, but she definitely has a personality. And, uh, you know, we're hopeful of uh, big things there as well. And you mentioned a good point uh, in talking about Greg McNair that, uh, you know, you only talk to him uh, every so often. Uh, you you kind of let him do his thing. Is that your approach? Um, I know some owners want to be really hands-on and, and want to be in regular communication. Others sort of step back and say, hey, I've hired you to, to do the job. I'm just going to let you do it and you uh, communicate with me when you need to. What Where do you fall in there? You know what? I would say with age, I've learned to be... I've learned um, I've learned behavior to be how I am now. When I was involved in the the horse racing business in you know the mid 2000s, like uh, early 2000s, I had a much different mentality. I was way more hands on. I was out there all the time, calling, checking up. Right now, um, there's an accountability with the trainers, and they know what they need to do. So I do. Uh, and I think if you ask anybody that trains horses for me, they rarely hear from me. Um, you know, I had a conversation with with uh, Chris Chris Ryder a few days ago, and I, I I don't know if he knew who I was when I told him it was Steve Heimbecker. I think he. So, I try to limit the uh, the contact, and and that's for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, it allows them to stay focused. And in this business, we know that there's there's a lot of ups and downs, and things change, and especially with the young ones, you know, they've got to figure things out. And right now it's, you know, just pebbles in the sandbox. It's just putting in time right now. And, you know, I think I'm a little bit more in communication with the trainers when we're, we're, we're at racing stage, but right now, you know, I think I'm probably one of the best owners um, from a distance right now. I, that's, and it seemed to work for me, you know what? And, and uh, it, they're always receptive. And when I do call, they, they usually know who I am and they pick up the call. So that's nice. And with 60 horses all over North America, uh, it would be a full-time job if you were to uh, want to communicate with yeah, them on a day. This is true. So yeah, this is true. That's understandable. Yeah. Uh, a couple of other ones uh, we want to touch on. Um, some new stallions that, you know, we're excited to see their first crops hit the racetrack uh, soon. Drop the Rake Freddies, an $85,000 Lexington uh, purchase, a son of Huntsville. And uh, Pearl Snaps is uh, by Fear the Dragon. This was a $125,000 Harrisburg purchase for you. Uh, who has uh, these two and, and how are they going? Yeah, they're, um, they're both going really well. Um, Drop the Rake Freddy is a Huntsville. And the story with that one was um, I didn't go down to the sale. Clearly, I was here because of COVID. We couldn't go across the border. So I had Julie Miller kind of looking at a few uh, horses for um, Aaron Byron and myself. So I've got Aaron training uh, five or six uh, yearlings right now. And uh, obviously his family's uh, got a history and they know what they're doing. He's got tons of sounding boards and uh, Aaron's a good young guy, um, probably a driver first and trainer second, but um, you know, he's, uh, he's getting a great opportunity and he's got some, some good people. And uh, um, this Colt is, I mean, Knock on wood, this this Colt is a hundred percent the real deal. He is probably the sexiest looking two year old that I've ever bought, and I've bought a lot of them. And uh, this thing absolutely looks the part. Um, amazing attitude. Um, doesn't have uh, really anything wrong with him. Uh, we're really excited about this thing. You know, he's he's tearing uh, tearing Aaron's hands off every. Uh, every training goal right now. And uh, I know at the barn he's at, um, I know Ben and Colin Johnson are out there and a few other guys. And I think they've, uh, they've seen this Colt go. And uh, I think they'd say the same thing. He's a pretty nice animal. Um, so fingers crossed, but um, you know, I think we got a really nice Huntsville there. And um, I think he's going to be pointed towards some pretty big races this year. Um, and then Pearl Snaps is another one too, that, um, is with Blake McIntosh actually and uh, Blake called me and he was down at the sale and said Steve 
I, I got this Colt. You got, we got to, we got to bring this Colt home. He's unbelievable. He's one of my favorite, if not my favorites. Um, and I usually say that to Blake every year, like, just tell me which one your favorite is and, and we'll figure it out. And, uh, this was a fear of the dragon on, on, on Ohio Colt. And, um, I would say he's almost as good looking as drop the rake Freddie. Uh, but he, he would be probably the second nicest Colt that I have. And, um, Blake's pretty high on this thing. Um, in fact, I got the staking bill a few weeks ago and, and I'm just going through the numbers and it's a big pill to swallow when these things come out, of course, and there's no racing. So I'm going through my little thing here and I see pearl snaps, you know, $10,000 for this Ohio. So I, I text Blake and I said, Blake, what's up here? I said, is this like, we just were paying $10,000. And he said, yeah, it's similar to the Mohawk million. It's a paid in event, but Steve, this Colt's a really nice Colt. Like you want to do this. And, uh, Again, he, it's it's similar to Greg. Blake doesn't say too much, so when he says, "Steve, this is a really nice Colt," and he says, "We're doing this thing for ten thousand into this Ohio sort of thing," um, I hang up the phone and I smile. So we're good. So I think we got a a pretty nice Colt there as well, and uh, hopefully we can make a splash with uh, with both of these. They be they're they're nice Colts. Good. Well, we've been talking about 10 minutes, and, and I think you've mentioned probably six or seven different names of trainers that you're using. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, so any young up-and-coming trainers watching tonight, you might want to uh, introduce yourself to Steve somewhere along the line uh, this year. Uh, one more on the pacing side to talk about here, uh, Steve, and uh, you really dug deep uh, into the pocketbook on this one. $375,000 yearling purchase from Lexington. The Big Hen. This is a Captain Treacherous from the outstanding uh, producing mare Mythical. Uh, she's produced a million dollar winner in Medusa and of course the uh, Ontario Sire Stakes uh, champion Alicorn. Um, what are early reports on the on the Big Hen this year? Yeah, the Big Hen is a uh, she, she's a very, very nice looking filly. I, I, I think she was the highest uh, priced Philly in, in North America last year out of the sales. So um, I didn't want to go that high. Um, I had uh, been talking back and forth with um, uh, David, David Maneri, who, um, you know what, has had a lot of stuff going on in his life. And, and I decided to deal with Dave and we do have a history from years and years ago. But um, you know what, I'm, I, Dave's doing a good job. You know, I'm proud of his uh, sobriety. Uh, he's made some changes in his life. And, and, uh, I recall talking to Dave and said, listen, what do you think of this filly? Like, take a peek. And he just said, yeah, she looks great, Steve, but, you know, it's going to be expensive. And I was on the phone with him when she was going through and, you know, 200 and 225 and so on. And, and uh, you know, we hit the 375 mark and, and uh, the hammer dropped and, and the rest is history. But the reports have been uh, very good. Um, she's doing everything right. Um, she had a little issue with, uh, some teeth, but we got that fixed up and, um, she's going fantastic. She's in the, in the top group over there at Classy Lane and, and she loves to do her work and she's got a good attitude and, uh, we're pointing her towards, um, obviously the Grand Circuit events and, uh, and, uh, hopefully she'll, uh, have a big heart and a motor, but she's a really, really nice looking filly. Very, very nice looking filly. Now, last year, you said, uh, I, I think your numbers were pretty much similar in terms of the volume of, of horses that, that you purchased. Uh, in terms of money, though, uh, this past year, is it, it the most you've shelled out of the yearling sales, or, or how does it compare? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think uh, after the first sale, I think Lexington was before Harrisburg, I believe. Yeah, Lexington was. And I remember uh, Brad Grant called me and said, you know, Stevie, what, what the hell are you doing? Like you're buying everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know what, I, I, I did make a big investment this year, but it, it, it's a strategy in my part. You know, I bought a lot of fillies because I, I, I want to consider getting into the broodmare game, uh, at some point, um, and potentially breeding to some of these nice fillies that I bought the big hen, for example, lady Lou, which we talked about. Um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity there. And, um, I, I think with what's going on, um, let's support it. Someone's got to win these races and, um, you know, wh why not me? So I'm going to give it every opportunity. And, and, uh, with, I think 31, two year olds acquired last year, um, 
you know, even if I buy a little less um, at the yearling sales this fall, I'll still have a nice, uh, hopefully, uh, reoccurring group with the with the three year olds uh, next year as well. So. And you have a, a variety of, of, of ownership or partnerships that you're involved in. And as mentioned earlier, some you, you own outright yourself. Uh, how do you determine uh, which ones you're going to partner on or which ones uh, you're going to go solo on? Yeah, there's really no, um, there's no, um, it just kind of plays out that way. If I really like something, um, you know, I'll buy it myself. Um, if I'm dealing with certain trainers and, and they really like uh, an animal uh, and they say this horse, uh, this colt, this filly or whatever, um, you know, I, I'm more than happy to buy it. If they want to come in, they can come in. Um, some of the trainers will put groups together. Um, I typically like to be, you know, 30 to 50% though um, on, uh, on the yearling buys. Um, that kind of keeps me uh, motivated and involved and interested. Um, but I think partners in this game are important, right? So for a lot of reasons, we want more people to um, share in the success of horses. And, and uh, you know, you don't want, you know, 10 horses and 10 owners. Um, you, you really want to have a, a diversified owners, ownership group. Um, and, you know, for example, the stable, I don't know how many people are involved with that, but you've got a bunch of people involved there. And, and uh, it's nice to, to have a, a variety of owners. And most of the people that I own horses with, I can pick up the phone and and have a good conversation with them. So that's nice too. Um, you know, I got a call from Jim Arvid who trains and breeds, or sorry, breeds uh, some really nice horses in Kentucky. And, um, you know, he just called me out of the blue and we had a great conversation a few months ago. So one thing I like about this business is that, you know, you've got other people involved. So I don't think I'd ever own them all myself. It's no fun that way. You got nothing to complain about <laughs> to <Yeah>. anyone. <laughs> And the more people you meet, the more, uh, I guess, potential partnerships down the road and, and always that opportunity to, uh, you know, maybe get involved in the next world champion. So I'm sure that's something that uh, that keeps you motivated. Um, we're here with Steve Heimbecker tonight. Again, we would uh, would love to hear from you tonight. If you've got a question or a comment, uh, leave it for us. We're going to take a commercial break. And when we come back, we'll talk Mohawk Million. We'll talk uh, Courtly Choice and, and much more. So stay tuned. You're watching COSA TV. In a field lies hope, anticipation, from the biggest races to the brightest stages, taking you on the wildest ride. Forbidden trade, forbidden trade, with a gigantic upset. Tall Dark Stranger answers the bell. For the glory, the pride, the payoff, enter the field, the Ontario Sire Stakes Program, from Ontario Farms to the world stage. Harness Racing Update is the sport's most comprehensive and timely news source. HRU covers the sport from all angles with news, features, photography, opinion, and analysis of racing. Also, HRU covers breeding and sales, as well as industry stories you need to know. It's all delivered by a deep, diverse, and talented team of writers and photographers. And the best news is that it's free to subscribe. Subscribe to HRU today for free at HarnessRacingUpdate.com and see what everyone is talking about. By now, you know the name COSA TV, an industry leader producing unique, high-quality digital content promoting harness racing in Ontario. Features, virtual programming, live events and more, COSA TV has it covered. Follow our social media channels and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page to view the latest content. And if you're looking to bet your favorite Ontario track, check out hpibet.com. COSA TV, taking Ontario racing global. And welcome back alive. Hope you're enjoying your Sunday night and uh, you're watching COSA TV. Steve Heinbecker, our special guest uh, here this evening. And uh, Steve, uh, big news announced recently that uh, the Mohawk Million is going to be back for a second consecutive year. And I know you were particularly happy uh, to see that this event was going to be back on the schedule again. Uh, but let's go back to last year. Uh, you had purchased a spot, I believe, in partnership ahead of time with, with Brad Grant. Is that uh, correct? And maybe you can tell us the story. Instagram, your three fillies. Yeah. So um, 
we had actually, I'm part of the ownership with uh, Maverick and um, uh, a decision to uh, buy a spot in the inaugural uh, Mohawk Million and it was slated for him. Uh, obviously, we had some some challenges with uh, with year old and uh, we ended up, uh, well, Brad really spearheaded it. He did a great job. Uh, for the group, he spearheaded a, a conversation with uh, Julie Miller um, to take over our spot, and um, the rest is history. So um, I can't really say I I won that race, but it kind of was a W for us, and uh, super happy for uh, Julie and Andy uh, and the Orange Crush team. They do a great job, and I've got some horses with her. And, uh, um, you know, I bought the spot with Julie and Dan Plouffe this year for uh, – basically a colt that i'm involved with uh, trunk bay uh he was a big muscle hill buy and uh and uh we'll see if he can make the slot this year and if not uh you know there's there's a handful of other ones that i'd love to throw in there that i'm i'm involved with so hopefully, hopefully sure. we can actually uh utilize the spot but uh, that's that's what happened last year yeah and you mentioned the maverick uh, the highest priced yearling uh, in the history of the sport 1.1 million so uh, pretty cool to be part of the group that uh, was able to collar him for that price. That's uh, the good news. The bad news is uh, he didn't meet expectations this past year. We were joking a little bit before we came on camera, but uh, where's he at? I mean, how, first of all, how much does he have to make to recoup his money this year? Uh, and then, uh, you know, but just tell us, uh, you know, is he is he back on track? Do you think he's going to be at least close to the horse you expected this year? Well, I mean, it is it is horse racing. We'll see. Um, I think Tony uh, Tony was on um, uh, HRU, I think, uh, a few nights ago, and uh, he commented on on Maverick. He was just a little immature as a two year old, and and um, I think uh, he's he's put on some weight where he needed to. I think he's he's matured a little bit and gotten smarter. Um, you know, I think he's training down the way we all hoped, and um, you know, as far as recouping money. Um, you know, it, it, it's going to be a challenge, I think. Um, there's a lot of competition out there and a lot of two-year-olds that had some pretty nice campaigns. So um, I, I think the goal this year would be, and there really wasn't any pressure last year uh, either. We've got a great ownership group. You know, we, we support Tony. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, you pay what you pay and, and that's part of the game. And, you know, these horses get in the barn and they really don't know how much they're they're worth. So... Um, but I do think we're going to have a, a good campaign with Maverick this year, and uh, we're all optimistic, and, and it's just bet, you know, best foot forward at this point. And that's it, right? Uh, you don't have to make it all back uh, in your two-year-old year, and uh, you know some develop at uh, a later stage. I think Sandpale would be a great example uh, of that. And uh, yep. uh, good to hear, though, that he's, he's uh, you know, uh, showing improvement this year, and, and uh, we really look forward to seeing him back and, and hopefully showing, uh, showing what he can do this year. Uh, but let's talk uh, some of the babies you have. Again, really high-profile youngsters. Uh, a couple from First Crop Stallion, Walter, and uh, I'm sure you, like a lot of people, are very excited to see his offspring hit the racetrack uh, this year. Talk about clenched fist, uh, $190,000 yearling buy. And all diesel, a forty-five thousand dollar yearling purchase. Uh, how are those two looking? Yeah, and you know what? I am excited to, you know, I'm excited about the Walners. You mentioned that. You know, I'm excited about the Walners. I, you know, obviously on the pacing side, I like the Huntsville's uh, as well. But these two are, are both going really well. Um, I'm in partnership with uh, Clench Fist with uh, uh, the Miller Stables, Julie Miller, and uh, a few other owners. Um, He's going very well, doing everything right. Um, Julie's pretty optimistic about him, and um, you know he's training with um, with Trunk Bay and and uh, doing everything he needs to do at this point. It's early, um, you know. They're really not, you know, uh, sharps on the times right now. They're just kind of putting in the miles. So, um, but we are optimistic that he's going to be racing as a two-year-old, uh, number one, and and number two will will hopefully be. Uh, competitive and for that price point you know we are pointing him towards some some uh, some marquee races and we're grand circuit type thing so there's nothing that's told us that we can't go that direction with this colt he's pretty handy and and i know julie's really happy so um 
he was a little more expensive. He was 190000 And on the flip side, we got all diesel for 45000 uh, another Walner, which is with uh, Aaron Byron. And um, Aaron's had uh, his father, Steve, come out a few times and, and go with some of the trotters that we have. And, and um, this, he, he's a nice colt. He has got a real quick foot. He can definitely trot up a storm. Uh, but like most trotters, I think we just got to make sure his head screwed on right. So I think that's going to be the challenge is just keeping this, this guy under wraps. Um, um, he's definitely made some drastic improvements. Um, I think Aaron, uh, and the staff have, you know, they've rigged him a little bit. Uh, they hung him up a little bit different and, and they're, they're, they're finding some things that are working a little bit better, but, uh, everybody that's around him, I think is pretty excited about this, uh, this Colt, uh, I, he's real deal, and that that's a great price. I mean, uh, you know, forty five thousand. If if we could get them all for that, and and have them look like what they are right now, it'd be it'd be great. But uh, he he also looks very 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 good. Yeah, and I know we had Linda Toscano on. Um, I think at the end of last year, talking about the great trotter she's had. But uh, you know, she she was pretty emphatic. Walner was uh, in terms of talent the best that she had had. And, uh, you know, he looked like, uh, almost a foregone conclusion that year in the Hamiltonian, but unfortunately we know that, uh, his career was derailed, but a really exciting trotter. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all excited to see his offspring on the racetrack. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, a $45,000 yearling purchase. You talked about uh, all diesel kind of the other end of the spectrum here. Let's talk about trunk Bay, a $400,000 yearling, uh, regally bred son, of Muscle Hill, the first foal from the $350,000 winner, Sunshine Delight. Uh, who has this one for you? So this is this is the one with uh, Julie Miller, which um, is part of the group with uh, um, Daniel Plouffe also owns and uh, John Fielding owns a piece as well. So this was really the, um, the preemptive sort of, that we're buying the spot for this Colt uh, in the Mohawk Million this year. Um, He's going well. Um, he's got uh, he's got some major attitude stuff. Uh, I think at this point we're contemplating uh, potentially gelding him, but uh, we just that's a big decision, especially when you've got a high priced animal like that. And and as far as you know the future and breeding and everything else, you know it's it's a tougher decision when you spend you know four hundred thousand dollars for a yearling. So um, Julie's navigating those waters, and and uh, we obviously lean on her expertise and. Um, she's a great communicator, um, and, uh, hopefully that works out, but, um, you know, he's, he's had a little bit of some issues, um, but, you know, we're still optimistic that he's going to be a very nice colt and, uh, obviously the breeding, uh, points to that. So hopefully, uh, you know, that'll be a, a good story as well. That would be a really uh, difficult decision to make. Uh, I, I could understand that. And uh, is it a case of just trying to exhaust all options before you, you get to that point? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's where we are right now. And then there, you know, that would set us back a little bit for timing. But, um, you know, Julie's not a, a, a rush, push the buttons sort of trainer anyway. So uh, if we got a later start with the Colt, there's there's tons of money in the, in the fall if you're a good trotter as a two year old so I don't think it's it's a uh, it's a concern about you know when will he get out or how will he heal and that sort of thing I think to your point it's just a big decision when you spend you know that kind of money um, and uh, you know we've got you know four great owners obviously on this uh, on this uh, trotter and you know we would love to hit a grand slam and. Uh, you know, the stars align this thing's a sire one day and, and we're winning the biggest races we can. But right. I, I think it's a, it could become problematic when the horse people are at risk and they're potentially, you know, could get hurt as a result of, um, you know, the trotter just being a little bit too aggressive, then, you know, something's got to change. And if it's just a performance thing, then we also have to consider that as well. So, you know, Julie will kind of point us and, and, let us know what the best thing is to do. And then, um, you know, normally we'll have a group consensus and go from there. All right. And the last one I wanted to ask you about, uh, World at War Dale. Uh, this one sired by Chapter 7, another uh, top producer in North American racing, a $70,000 Lexington purchase, so kind of a mid-priced uh, horse. Uh, who has this one and, and uh, how is uh, 
how has World at War Dale been going for you so far? Yeah, um, this cult is something else. It's uh, Dave Maneri has uh, um, been looking after him. This cult, when he arrived here, I recall I took my youngest daughter out, Rory, who's nine, nine now, eight at the time. And um, this cult in the field, I mean, what an amazing looking animal was just trotting around beautiful long strides put together well almost looked like a three-year-old um and i was out to classy lane a few weeks ago and i saw him again and you know dave uh and his staff they're really excited about this colt um he's definitely in the top two trotters that they have and uh he, i mean he looks like a three-year-old you know um he's uh he's he's a pretty nice animal to watch go um He's probably the nicest looking uh, two-year-old colt I have right now. Um, and he seems to want to do the work. And uh, he's got a lot of go. And uh, we'll see how low he can go. But uh, we're pretty excited about this. And the fact that it's a, a Chapter 7 is uh, um, is a nice thing, too. I did kind of mix up the, the sires and stuff. And, and uh, um, anyway, this he, there, there's no reason why, if things didn't work out for the other ones, that... that this one could race in the Mohawk Million, so I'm just I'm knocking on wood, but I've got th I, there's three or four that could probably take the spot, so we'll see. Yeah, uh, massive investment and uh, you know regally bred youngsters that uh, you're starting out with, so uh, you're giving yourself every opportunity to get there. Uh, is it safe to say, Steve, that um, you know this type of investment on the trotting side is a direct result or or certainly strongly tied to having the Mohawk million on the calendar? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement, Greg. I mean, I think, um, you know, the whole concept of the, you know, buying into the race um, and saving that 10 spot for the, the winner of the, um, the William Memorial there, I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it's good for racing. And, and obviously it's, it's a big purse. It's a huge purse. Um, and, you know, over the years, we've seen some of the marquee races in North America. Um, I mean, the Pepsi North American Cup at, at the time, way back when, used to go for $1.5 million. Um, you know, so the purses have come down and, and some of them have come back up. And, and clearly the Colts race for more than the, the Phillies. Um, but this is a great race. I mean, it's, it's a great race. It's a, it's a really good format. And um, it's a huge purse. You know, it really, uh, it really um, makes an incentive, or at least uh, validates buying some nice trotters. And with the the fact that uh, you know Bill and the group uh, have allowed um, the same as the uh, the first year for the spot to be sold or leased or you know what have you, um, you know, doesn't peg or pigeonhole someone into the to, you know a pretty bad spot. So um, you're going to get ten nice trotters in the gate come September there and. Uh, and uh, I'd love to be uh, in the fans watching that stands. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it, it, it was hard to know last year what to expect, uh, you know, not able to have a crowd there and whatnot. But uh, I would say two to three weeks before the race started, you could really notice the, the buzz ramp up as we got closer to it. And uh, and I think a lot of it was that jostling for, for spots and, you know, wondering if guys were going to be able to, to purchase spots from other people that, that had them. And uh, that added a whole other element to the race that, you know, we don't have anywhere else. So uh, I think that was key to, to the success in terms of mm. uh, creating that that uh, atmosphere and the buzz around the race. So, uh, yeah, we're excited to see it back this year, too, and, and can't wait to cover it for COSA TV. And uh, looking forward to getting uh, more updates from you in the, in the next few weeks on these trotters as they get closer and... Uh, and the baby races will be here before you know it. Uh, yeah, too. can't wait. Um, let's talk three-year-olds, uh, a couple in particular that you've got coming back that you have high hopes for. Um, we'll begin with a, a colt named Pirate Hanover. Now, uh, I think it's safe to say it was kind of a hard luck season for this guy, no question. Oh. Um, I mean, it started good, Steve. We're going to get a look at his very first uh, race, I believe it was, here at Mohawk Park. And, uh, yeah, we'll have a look at the replay here. Uh, just talk about this night. I mean, it's your first start, things go beautifully. And, and you know, when you watch this race unfold and afterwards, you got to be feeling like, hey, we're right on track for a nice season with this Colt. Yeah, it's it's that's exactly what it was. Um, I know that um, 
we 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 were strategizing and the goal and brad and i had talked about it with tony uh we really felt like we had the metro winner uh in the barn in, in pirate hanover and uh obviously he was doing everything right at the start here uh in fact doug called me i think they were doing a school or some sort of uh just a tightener of mohawk and and doug called me and said hey um this pirate hanover that you've got here you know he just went 27 on the end of a mile here and and no one was around. It was just him, you know, and uh, we were pretty excited about him. And, and the whole thing when he came out in August, I think he started up a little late, I think in August, the goal was to get him and groom him for the Metro. That, that was our target. Um, a few of the people that I know, and I usually don't jinx things because I'm very superstitious, but I, I did say to a few people, I'm going to win the Metro. Uh, didn't work out circling back to what you said turned out to be a just a heartbreaker uh campaign for him as a two-year-old yeah i mean watching him there uh, he, he reminds me of a of a former uh top colt that alanya and mcnair teamed up with and stay hungry um similar you know kind of on the pedigree side as yep. well um and, and yeah it just looks like he has all the tools uh we know in the metro what happened uh, had the mishap and, and went down not uh, Tell us, uh, you know, for those who maybe didn't know the full story, what what exactly happened that night, and, and how did he ultimately come out of that? Yeah, I was I actually went to that race with uh, with my uh, my father Fred, so we were there, and uh, you know we were feel, feeling pretty confident about uh, the elimination, and and the way the the race went, they just went super slow to the half, um, a snail's pace, and you know Dougie was trying to do the right thing, you know, just explode late. Um, you know, come quick on the end and, and obviously get them uh, primed and ready for the uh, the Metro the following week, the final. And um, he basically, you know, he had a, a hopple hanger that broke is essentially what happened. And, and Doug actually did a really nice job of, of grabbing up this colt um, and quite frankly, protecting himself. It could have been really bad, actually. Um, Pirate came out of the race. He was fine. Um, you know, uh, Tony gave him the, the, the once over, we had someone look at him. He did have some, some nicks and some cuts cause he did go down, uh, on the front end and, um, just bad luck. I mean, he should have won that elimination by, you know, three or four open lengths, uh, easy. And I think it was just a combination of, you know, he was just raring to go and the pace was really slow. And then, you know, when Doug, Doug gave him his head and it was just too much all at once and a little hang up on the, the hopple and the rest is history. Right. So, um, yeah. it was, it was a pretty disappointing night and it was, it was probably one or I think it was, you know, the one time I went to the track, uh, during the COVID stuff. So anyway, I was going to say, uh, you know, as an owner absolutely has to be your worst nightmare to be there live and see one of your horses do that. And what, I mean, what's your initial reaction, if you can put it into words? Um, I was in a little bit of shock, but I was, I, I was worried about, uh, obviously, Doug and the horse was my, my next thing. You know, uh, racing is racing, but, I mean, he's a very talented colt, and I know that Tony is extremely high on this colt. And I think with the three-year-olds this year, I truly believe that it's going to be a really open division in the, in the big boys. Uh, I think the three-year-old pacing Colt uh, Grand Circuit stuff this year is going to be wide open. And I think he's going to be a player. Um, so originally when this happened, yeah, I was a little, I had text Doug, I think, later on that, you know, shortly after the race and just made sure he was okay. And, um, you know, obviously was in contact with Brad and Tony. And, uh, um, yeah, it's just, it's a heart dropper. It really is because, you know, yeah. again, you love the animal, right? And, and, and. You know the game comes second so you know i i don't want to see anybody get hurt um uh, certainly not uh, your own horse or your own your own driver so um but it worked out in the end i guess uh, people were okay and healthy and you know what we we've got a really nice three-year-old in our hands yeah so. um i was going to ask you what uh what the target date for a return is or do, do you know at this point what uh, what you're you'll be pointing them for at least early on um, I'm not quite sure. Actually, Tony called me a few days ago, and I haven't had a chance to call him back. But uh, that's that's probably what he's calling on. Um, we did stake this thing up pretty dearly, though, so I know that 
whether it's early, mid-campaign, or end of the year, uh, we do expect this Colt to, um, to make some noise. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can win some of the, the big races. And um, I would anticipate that the, the Colt would probably be out in early spring to qualify and go from there. Uh, let's talk about a Philly, a uh, three-year-old Philly coming back uh, last year. Uh, didn't win, or shouldn't say did win once, uh, but one win, six second-place finishes and 16 starts, but banked 200000 and runner-up a, a few times to a great Philly in uh, Party Girl Hill. So uh, talk about Lady Lou and, and the season she had. Did she exceed uh, your expectations? Yeah, Lady. Well, Lady Lou was. Um, I mean, she was. Last year was her three-year-old campaign, right? So, um, La- Lady Lou was. Uh, it's it's interesting. Brad Grant uh, bought Lady Lou at the sale, and um, Lady Lou came out and had a great qualifier early last year, and he had some interest from some other parties about um, selling. And uh, Brad and I own some nice racehorses together, and he gave me an opportunity to come in on Lady Lou. And um, you know, she she does have a real nice gait. Like she she's got the way she moves is fantastic. She's very good off the gate as well. She can leave. Um, she's not too hard on herself. Uh, she can carry speed through a quarter, uh, if not a half. Um, she's got a good burst, and she's good size. And um, you know, we're going to point her towards a few events this year, but. Um, she's a, she's a bank machine. She's just a nice, really nice, um, animal. And, uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, what the future holds, you know, I mentioned to you before the show, I think, you know, breeding is something that, you know, I think I'd, I'd like to get a little bit more involved with, whether it's breeding to my own brood mares, um, you know, having them, you know, throw some, some Ontario, um, stuff. I think that would be my goal. Um, and she would be one of those, obviously. She's a really, really nice, uh, a nice filly. And one nice thing about having a, a, a mare coming back into the aged ranks and being here in Ontario, we have many of the, the biggest races for the older uh, pacing mares right here at Mohawk Park. So, uh, you know, the schedule conducive to making uh, some money here. Uh, those, the three straight races I mentioned here in Canada last year, Fan Hanover Lemon Final, and then followed up in the uh, the Simcoe Stakes uh, right after that. Three second place finishes and uh, put a lot of money on her card last year. And again, chasing a great one in, in Party Girl Hill. So uh, excellent campaign for her. And uh, hopefully this year, uh, you know, uh, she gets her picture taken just a few more times. And if that happens, yeah. <laughs> uh, she'll, she'll exactly. have a great year. Uh, a yeah. horse, though, that, uh, you know, got you into the winner's circle uh, several times in many of the biggest uh, events, of course, is Courtly Choice. We'd be remiss if we didn't uh, reflect back on him, Steve. Uh, first of all, tell us uh, how you got involved in him. I believe you bought into him before his three-year-old year. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So um, I think he had qualified in 51 or something, and and I called Blake. Um, and uh, and I've known Blake for years as well, and... and uh, Blake's as solid as they come. Um, we have a lot in common and, uh, you know, we're around the same age and, and, uh, uh, we both, both like the fans? Maple Leafs. Yeah. We're yeah, both I'm Leaf fans. Say. So yeah, we're, we're not talking too much these days cause I don't want to jinx anything, but, uh, you know, I think potentially, uh, we got Campbell better as our goalie now, but that's enough. Yeah. Better game last night. So I reached out to Blake and I said, listen, I'd love to get involved, uh, with this Colt. And, he talked to the ownership group and, and um, they said, yeah, this is fine. And um, I told him I'd be involved in, in getting into some more horses with him in his barn and, and that I was back. Um, I took a short hiatus just because of my kids' his age. Uh, I needed to spend some time at home and enjoy that time uh, with the kids. And now, uh, you know, they don't want to be dropped off in front of the school or right at their friend's house. I got to go around the corner because I guess I'm not cool anymore. So uh, it's a good time to get get back into the horses. So I sure. I did speak to Blake and he was he was good about it. And um, the rest is history. Uh, amazing, <coughs> amazing Colt. Um, some great. I got some great stories and uh, just just a lot of really really good memories. Yeah, I mean he was one that uh, showed a lot of potential in his two year old year. So coming into the three year old campaign, uh, really the sky was the limit. 
uh, I would say, disappointment in the North America Cup in that he, he was just on the outside looking in from qualifying. But uh, the good news is he, he really made up for it as, as the year went on. And Little Brown Jug Day, uh, we're going to go back to that. First of all, talk about, again, disappointment, the elimination. We've had Blake on here, and, and it, your heart must have sunk when you saw him make that bobble behind the gate in the elim before he oh, even yeah. got to the final. Yeah, this was, um, you know, and this is this is the worst thing, and I do this to myself, but I, uh, I'm i so superstitious. I actually was going to come down uh, to the jug. If you can believe it, I didn't go. Um, I'm not superstitious. I literally left the house, had the car packed up, and, and uh, anyway, said, I, 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 so I don't feel right. I'm going to go home. I'm just going to watch it from home. I'm so superstitious. Anyway, turned around, and then when he did break in the elimination, I thought, what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> and uh, anyway, he did come back on and, and um, uh, qualified uh, for the final. And I remember talking to Blake, and I think he just assumed I was somewhere on the grounds. And uh, he said, you know, how is he? Is he okay? And he said, he's great. He says, we're, I, we're, I think we're going to win this thing. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's pretty aggressive, but, you know, let's do it. Um, and then uh, just the way he raced there, he looked like he was, you know, you can see him coming up here first up. And, and uh, you know, I think this is probably the quickest my heart's ever beated. And I'm not lying in probably in probably 20 years. Uh, this yeah. was the most exciting race that I've ever watched. Um, I was actually watching it on my laptop. And right here, I thought he was going going the wrong way, but... Then he got back on stride here, and uh, this is exciting around this last turn. Let's. Uh, and it almost looks like he's going to get past. I've probably seen this race. I could make this call actually down the thing here. If we turn this, <laughs> the sound off, I could make the call. I've watched this. And he just comes up. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. It's just, it was. It's one of the epic it was the guns, best. Steve. It really is. Oh, uh, it was... You know, there, there's wiggle it, jiggle it, there's life sign. You know, there's those really memorable little brown jugs. And I, I think Courtly Choice is probably in the top four or five. But, uh, you know, the way he I'd overcame agree. the break to win the Olympic yeah. and then the trip he went in the final. And, and he went by a good one, Lather Up. We know what Lather Up went on to do as an age performer. And he, he thoroughly dominated the older division uh, at a stretch. So... Yeah, Courtney yeah, he Choice had a, beat a really good group that day. Yeah, he did, and you know what? It was, uh, it was, it was. Uh, I was just overwhelmed with uh, with happiness, and and I think I sent Blake uh, a text for a year and a half of that race, just randomly every week. I'd send him a copy of the race. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's amazing, and you know what? He did. He he had Lather Up's uh, number that day, and actually, he he beat Lather Up again in the. Um, the Canadian Pacing Derby with uh, with James in the bike too, which was a, which is another win that I really enjoyed as well, uh, and that was on Canadian soil. So that was that was a real nice one too. Well, listen, speaking of that, we might as well have a look uh, at it. It's uh, yeah, this was a kind of an unexpected win, uh, Steve, because the horse hadn't been right at the top of his game coming in, but uh, no. you know the trip works out well. And again, uh, you know, walk us through what you're thinking as the race unfolds and, and where you're sitting at this point in time. What are you thinking? Well, Blake told me that the horse was pretty sharp. I mean, he had he had really made a, a conscious effort to um, to put some time into him and make sure that he was at his best. And uh, right here, you know, James is kind of third over, floating out a bit. Uh, fractions are pretty quick. Lather up's clearly the chalk. And then we just hit a gear. Right about here, I think he just sees some clear road and um, unbelievable close, like just... And there's Kenny Middleton, Courtly my man, Choice with the call. And it's Courtly Choice with a stunning upset. In yeah, the, the, the funny thing was I was interviewed by Sandra Snyder about three days before. And uh, she put out an article, and it was basically, will, will Heimbecker show for the Canadian Pacing Derby? And <laughs> I said, it's a game-time decision. And, and uh, when we won, I remember Blake texted me. I didn't go that night. I was up north fishing with my son in Balsam Lake. I probably woke up half the lake when this thing, uh, I was screaming again, uh, pretty elated. And, and uh, 
again, probably woke up a lot of people, but Blake actually told me, Steve, you're, you're not allowed to come to any races anymore. <laughs> so let, you win all the big ones when you don't show up. So I said, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, let's recap this. You weren't there at the jug. You weren't there for the pacing derby. You win. You went last year for Pirate Hanover's Metro LM, and we know what happened. And I was there, and I was there when he locked this. I know, and I was there when he locked wheels in the North American Cup. Courtly Choice did as well. So, uh, and I mean, he won the he won the limit or the consolation. But uh, um, yeah, I don't want to say I'm bad luck because I don't want my my friends and my other owners to stop buying horses sure. with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what about? Is, is, I'm sure there's some regret though that uh, you know you weren't there in person to really soak it in and, and experience it, or are you you happy with how it turned out? I'm I'm happy with how it turned out, and you know what? Anybody who knows me, um, um, I'm excited for all the connections. I mean, I'm I, I I really, it goes back to what I'm trying to do with you know give other people, young people, opportunity and everything else. There is a measurement, obviously. It's not a, a, a you know a handout, but um, I'm happy for for good horses, quality wins, uh, trophies are fantastic. Um, I'm not going to say no to that. I'm not allergic to any hardware, that's for sure. Um, I just, um, you know what, I am a really superstitious guy, but I enjoy it as much uh, from a distance uh, than I do in person. But I will say this, my strategy for the upcoming year is going to change. I've made a conscious decision to basically go as to, to many as many races as I can. So we'll, we'll see if we can get this uh, this jinx away. So um with COVID, I've I've now, I've now been missing it uh, a lot. So right. I'm not going like to elect to miss many more races. Yeah, exactly. And that was going to be my last question before we wrap up. Uh, you know, it's a pretty broad question, but what what are you looking forward to most uh, this year? You know what I I really think, I really think it's getting back to the way things were. Um, you know having the opportunity to go to the track and watch some of these big events with the crowds and, you know, with the live bands and, and some of the marquee events where, um, you know, we put on such a good show and it's a great place to go. And, you know, I think there's some challenges and I think it's really, it's really important that we were able to promote our product. And I do think that that means we've got to, we've got to get people back to the racetrack and, you know, whether that's plugging different things in, whether it's, you know, live entertainment or, you know, um, 218, the new bill. I mean, we want to protect our uh, our wagering pools um, and that sort of thing. So we got to plug other things into into um, into horse racing that will get people out to the track. And I know it's been a um, it's 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 been on everyone's radar to try to do that. And, and like yourself, I mean, you're you're. You're an advocate of uh, racing in Ontario, and you want to see the stands fill and and uh, full. And you know, I think things like the Mohawk Million and, and some unique events and uh, whatever add-ons we can create for people to get them out and their families and and start things going again. I think that would be my goal. I just I would love the option to go to the track and blend into a crowd. I just that that's really right. what I'm looking for. So yeah, I would echo that sentiment. And I, I, well said, and uh, I think there will be a, a real appetite uh, to experience, uh, you know, harness racing and other events live and, and in person again when when we're able I to agree. Really do so. I agree. All right. Well, yeah. we'll end we'll end on that note, uh, Steve. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time out on a on a Sunday night to enjoy it. A lot of fun, and uh, best of luck this year. A lot of big races Thanks. to look forward to. Yeah. Hopefully, we're talking again, Greg. I appreciate it. Sounds good. That's uh, Steve Heimbecker, and uh, watch for many of his performers on the uh, racetracks around North America this year in many of the sport's biggest races. A big thank you to him. Big thank you to you for tuning in, as always. And we will see you next time on another edition of COSA TV. By now, you know the name COSA TV, an industry leader producing unique, high-quality digital content promoting harness racing in Ontario. Features, virtual programming, live events, and more. COSA TV has it covered. Follow our social media channels and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page to view the latest content. And if you're looking to bet your favorite Ontario track, check out hpibet.com. COSA TV, taking Ontario racing global.